So this is a $2 million car now becoming part of the ocean. All right, so we are in September of 2022, and there is a hurricane coming towards Florida. This is Hurricane Ian. It was quite a big deal. It was a category four, 140 mile an hour winds, really bad news. Now, the good thing about hurricanes is that you can see them coming from like a week away. When the hurricane actually hit, all hell broke loose. You had uh, homes being destroyed. I mean, a lot of people lost their lives, and you had a bunch of cars going underwater. There was a car, and I, I think we would probably call it the car because it was the McLaren P1 that everyone saw on social media, on TikTok, on Instagram. And it was just floating underwater near a tree and getting bounced into things during the hurricane. This video was taken by its owner who owned that car plus another Rolls Royce. And he had those cars in his garage closed and the waters came into the garage and basically broke the garage door. The cars floated out and went 500 yards down the street, then, well, went completely underwater. And everybody, I mean, literally everybody on the internet sent me a message saying, hey, you need to get this car, you need to get this car. And I thought, well, I can't afford that kind of car. I mean, this is a McLaren P1. It's a hypercar, it's part of the Holy Trinity. And it's a car that on its worst day is worth a million dollars. And this car in particular was supposed to be the record setter for McLaren P1s. It only had 305 miles. It went on Bring a Trailer and it had a no sale at $1.57 million. And they were hoping that this would get like 2 million, 2.2, something like that. So it no sale that bring a trailer, then this guy buys it for reportedly $2 million, something like that. So this is a $2 million car now becoming part of the ocean in front of people's eyes, millions of people's eyes um, as a hurricane hit. And then afterwards, uh, about a month or two later, it shows up on Copart. And Copart is a site where you can buy uh, salvage cars. I mean, it doesn't have to be exotics, but uh, salvage, crashed, wrecked, that sort of thing. And uh, usually you can find deals, but on this car, they wanted to make as big a stink as they could, and they tried to get it in as many publications as they could, and it worked. I mean, Road and Track wrote about it, Jalopnik, Autopian, everybody wanted a piece of this because they didn't know where it was gonna go. So uh, on Copart, the listing only had like, seven or eight pictures. And they were all a little bit further back. You want details. You would want to see if, you know, the carbon was damaged or if there's any like, you know, crabs in the intake or something like that. This car went up for sale once and it no sailed at $400,000. Now, $400,000 is a lot of money. Uh, it's a lot of money for any car, especially a car that's been underwater. Now, the speculation there between uh, me and Ed Bullion and Houston Crosta and a bunch of other people in the exotic rebuild car sphere uh, is that this car would fetch anywhere between two fifty and eight hundred thousand dollars. And eight hundred was like the crazy, crazy price; like no one would ever pay that. But two fifty is what kind of the smart money would buy it for. It no sale at 400, meaning that the owner of the car, the insurance company, they said, we want more money because they just paid out a ton of money for this car uh, to the owner and that car plus the other car that was in his garage. So then they decided to put the car back up for sale on auction a week later because they were like, oh, maybe people didn't know about it. So they publicized it a little bit more. They put it on their blog and then it sells for 398 the second time. This entire time I'm watching it like a hawk. I don't have this kind of money. I really don't. And uh, I would have to sell many of my cars to maybe get there, uh, not even counting what the parts would be for that car. I mean, it's it's a one of 375 hypercar. And it's it, this is like the holy grail of McLarens for me personally, but I, I knew I could never afford it. But then it went up for sale a third time. And I felt like at this point, the universe is calling to me. Like the universe is just saying, hey, Freddie, you need to buy this car uh, and you need to make this happen. So what happened the third time is that they put a buy it now on it. And the buy it now was $600,000. And 
I was like, ah, 600 grand is a lot of money. I mean, I could maybe stretch that if I sold like three of my cars really, really quickly and then I'd still be losing money. But then the universe came through again because the buy it now went from 600 to 575 in like two days. And then I said, okay, well now, now I'd be stupid not to buy it. I asked one of my friends that has made some good financial decisions in his life and he knows about me and making my bad financial decisions. And I asked him, hey, do you know anybody that could loan me half a million dollars like within a week? And then he said, you know what, I do. And I went to this bank and I told them, hey, I'm a YouTuber and I wanna buy this flood McLaren P1. It doesn't work. It probably was all the way underwater and everything needs to be replaced. And they gave me a loan in like three days. So now I had the money to buy this car and I ended up buying the car at the buy it now price because I make really good financial decisions. As soon as I hit the, the buy it now and the, the money goes through, I start freaking out because I'm like, this is more money that I've spent on any car ever. This one doesn't work. And this has so many eyeballs on it already that I don't know if whatever I can do to this car is gonna live up to whatever hype they built in their own heads. So the time came to get the car and this was like within 24 hours, like I paid for the car and then I went to get the car the next day. So me and my friend Jack and my friend Rex, we uh, took his Toyota Tundra with a $2,000 open trailer and we went to get this $2 million hyper car that was sitting in this Copart lot. We get there and the first thing that they hand me was a cardboard box, like a USPS box. And it has the keys, it has the owner's manual and a bunch of little manuals for like the radio and stuff like that. That owner's manual went on eBay for like $5,000 and they, they just handed it to me. I mean, it was pristine, it wasn't in the flood or anything, it was fine, but it was just like, you just handed me thousands of dollars worth of stuff. I haven't even seen the car yet. This is really, really cool. So we go around their, uh, their yard and they had this P1 in their special little warehouse lot right all the way in the back, not to be, you know, confused with the regular, the riffraff, you know, you don't want it with the mixing with the other cars. That car was in its own little warehouse with the other car that was in the guy's garage, which is a Rolls Royce Phantom, a brand new one, which is in itself worth probably half a million dollars. So we open up the door and there it is. And automatically, I, I get like, I get a cold sweat and I get like a sinking feeling, but also I get really excited because I see the car and it is so much worse than what I saw in the pictures. So the pictures are interesting because what the camera does is it hides a lot of crimes. I mean, to, to take a phrase from Adam Savage, you can't see the carbon damage and there was a lot of it on camera. But when you see it up close, you see that every single panel is damaged. One thing about the McLaren P1 is that every panel is carbon fiber. They didn't use any plastic, they didn't use any cloth or or, or anything uh, like they used on the uh, 12C and 650S of the day. That car was completely bespoke, especially like body-wise, and everything needed replacement or, or repair. So I get there and this car smells awful. It just smells like the bottom of the ocean. They didn't take any of the like the twigs or, and, and stuff out. Like it was full of sand and uh, both of the rear tires were flat. One was flat because the tow truck driver that actually pulled it onto the uh, flatbed, he punctured one of the tires and on the other side, he punctured one of the wheels. And those wheels are really thin forged aluminum, super expensive, super lightweight and super broken now. Now both rear tires are flat. This car can't move because the e-brake was still on. It has an electronic e-brake and I can't power up the car to make those go off. So uh, we spent the next four hours trying to get it onto a trailer. We used dollies. We actually got into the uh, trunk, with the front trunk, because there is like a keyhole that you can kind of finagle open. And uh, we found the tow hook and that was still in okay shape, uh, you know, albeit a bit rusty. And we spent the next several-ish hours getting this car on the trailer and then the next day getting it off the trailer. And then I can see what the car was actually like. And it was bad, it was <laughs> so bad. So let me give you a rundown of what this McLaren P1 needed. It had 316-ish very easy miles and 500 yards are really just 
terrible treatment. It was damaged on the diffuser, the hood, the clamshells, and there, there are two big clamshells, one in the front, one in the back. Those were damaged because it's just hitting trees and stuff like that. The panels were misaligned because uh, water pressure does weird things to panels. The doors had uh, cracks in them. The glass in the front and the glass on the top, it actually has two glass panels on the top. Those are both broken. The glass in the back shattered, completely gone. The carbon fiber panel that opens up to allow you to charge the car, that was gone. So that's somewhere in Fort Myers area. The tail light was, it looked like a, a tree went through it. There was a giant gaping hole in the, in the carbon clamshell in the back. And on the bottom of the car, uh, whenever the tow truck driver, this is my favorite guy in the world right at this point, when he got the car onto the flatbed, uh, it was sitting on what looked like a toilet. And I don't know if it was a toilet, it just kind of looked like one. And he dragged it. And when it dragged, it put a gouge into the carbon tub, like the actual structure of the car. So now there's just like a nice little zipper rip in there. And then on the inside, the inside smells like electrical fire because it has a battery. And the battery is a really big hybrid battery uh, that allows the car to get to 903 horsepower, you know, plus its uh, internal combustion engine. It allows the car to drive in electric only mode for like about six miles. It's a really cool feature of the car and that just by the smell alone, looked like it fried completely. The inside was also uh, completely full of corrosion and salt. Uh, everything on the inside was submerged at one point. So usually when you have these Copart listings for a flood car, they have this like little drawing on the side of the car uh, that says WL, which is waterline. That's so you know, above this line, the electronics are probably okay. My car didn't have that because the entire thing was underwater. I mean, the roof scoop where the air goes in, that had sand in it. So this was like the worst of any flood car possible, really, because not only was it uh, underwater, it was a saltwater flood. And a saltwater flood plus like a bunch of debris just went in everywhere. Uh, as you can imagine, when a hurricane comes through, it's not a clean thing. I ended up having to take off the clamshell and then I saw the actual engine, which is like, you know, stuffing 10 pounds of crap in a five pound bag. Like they really put a lot of things into this car and every single part was either corroded, you know, not a ton of rust because they didn't use a lot of steel and nothing like no iron that could rust. But you did have corrosion on aluminum components that uh, had this process called electrolysis, which like, when the battery was in its death throes, it would start eating, like the salt would start eating away at the uh, aluminum frame. So that was, that was really cool. They don't tell you that uh, when, when you buy cars uh, at a salvage lot. So taking this car apart was actually not that hard. Um, and at the point of this video, I still don't have the entire engine apart, but I know that the engine is, it's, it's probably salvageable, which is like, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna count my chickens before they hatch, but it's it looks promising for now, but it's gonna have to go all the way apart, you know, maybe down to the carbon tub, and then even that's gonna need to be replaced. But one thing that I really, like there's a lot of little wins in this build because all the connectors in the back, all the harness connectors, they're weather sealed. So like nothing got damaged in the back of the, uh, of the harness. Um, so like all the electrical connections, all the ECUs and all that stuff that live in the back of the car, they were fine. But that wasn't the case for the interior of the car. That wasn't the case for the front of the car where the 12 volt battery lives. That was full of water. Basically the engine back is okay. The engine forward, it's, it's no good. And as you can imagine, McLaren charges a lot of money for stuff for their hypercar. The prices that I got from McLaren, uh, like if you have a private jet, I feel like sometimes the maintenance on a private jet would be a little bit less than a McLaren P1. The battery alone, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the biggest thing in the car, but like the battery, the hybrid battery pack that sits above the fuel tank, that if you wanted to get it new from McLaren, is $160,000. I feel like that's a lot of money. I feel like, you know, for a battery, we have the technology now that, you know, we could put hybrid batteries in Corollas and Camrys and stuff, right? They're not $160,000. I don't know why McLarens are 160. dollars I mean, the Artura just came out, right? The Artura and that car all in is like 
200 something thousand dollars. You can't tell me that that battery is 160 grand. That battery is super bespoke. It's only made for that car. It's uh, It was made by a Canadian company and then bought by another company. So it's like, they only made a handful of these things. And the way the McLaren fixes these batteries is just by getting used parts. So these are like rare as hen's teeth. If I can get one, then it's gonna be an exorbitant amount of money. Now, then comes the bodywork. If you wanted to get a uh, carbon body, a um, an actual like exposed carbon body from McLaren, and you had like a regular P1 that wasn't underwater, uh, it would cost you $300,000. So that all in, you know, plus, you know, getting it to McLaren and all that stuff for them to do it, it's 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 another half a million dollars. And that's not even counting the wiring, uh, the engine, the turbos, turbos are seized, the transmission, the hybrid drive assembly that goes in between the engine and transmission. Then all the little knickknack items. I mean, like uh, the little pumps and the hoses and stuff that can corrode that you don't know, you know, like the copper washers on the uh, suspension, like those can blow out because those are super high pressure pressure uh, and copper and salt water don't mix. So those those immediately started leaking. So now you have suspension issues and then, then you have like the actual mechanical damage that you got to fix with bodywork. So I mean, it's realistic that this car would cost, you know, if you were to go the retail route, north of a million dollars to fix and then the car would be worth probably a million dollars or less. Now, a lot of people think that when you get a salvage car or like a wrecked car or, or something, you're actually saving money. And, and the, <laughs> the secret is you don't. It actually is not any less expensive than if you were to just bought one used. And uh, now you have a car that's worth way less because you built it and it's also carrying a salvage title. Now with this car, this is so much more than any other car in terms of price that that I uh, could have like bargained for. So for YouTube, this makes no sense. I mean, even taking it off of YouTube for a rebuilder, this makes absolutely no sense. But for YouTube, I may have like a fighting chance at maybe making some sort of money back. Even then I'm gonna have a P1 that's worth less than a regular retail version. But the thing that I get from it is that I, I built this thing and I'm gonna build it the way I want. And it's gonna cost me less in terms of like actual cash that I spent on it because you know, you can offset sponsors and YouTube ad revenue and stuff like that. And uh, if I wanna, you know, eat ramen noodles for the next five years, you know, I could, I could put that into the uh, equation. But a Mr. Beast video probably wouldn't pay for the rebuild of this car, uh, realistically. And I, I don't get Mr. Beast numbers, so this is, this is gonna be fun. The simple lease from Premier Financial Services is the most powerful tool in the world of exotic car financing. You get all the benefits of a lease, like the tax preference as well as the low payments, plus the benefits of a traditional loan. You can build up equity, pay it off at any time, and along the way you'll know exactly where you stand with their easy to understand amortization table. Premier's amazing nationwide team is standing by and ready to help you own your dream car in a way that's easier and more affordable than you could ever imagine. Whether it's a vintage Porsche, a modern McLaren, or a multi-million dollar car collection, Premier is here to help. They've been supporting Vinwiki for the last six years and we certainly love them for that, but even more so, we love them because they make it easier and more affordable than you could imagine to own your dream car.